Good afternoon. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. It's September 14th, 1998, and this afternoon we have the privilege of interviewing Mr. Donald A. Chase. Good afternoon, Mr. Chase. Hello. How are you? Fine. Um, could I ask you, Mr. Chase, where you're currently living? I live in Framingham. Massachusetts. Yes, Framingham, Massachusetts. And you are married? Yes, I am. And your wife's name? Carol. And you have children? Yes, I have three children and three grandchildren. And could I ask you your age? 72. Where were you born? I was born in Framingham. And were you raised there? No, I, was raised, I lived on, well, to say the first 29 years of my life in Natick, West Natick. And what was it like growing up in West Natick? Oh, it was a great town. The whole town was great. I mean, uh, it was all seemed to be divided into like sections: West Natick, East Natick, North Natick, and South Natick. And they were every every section had a big field for playing baseball in football. Every section had a pond or a lake for skating in the winter time and everything. No, it, it was a great town to grow up in. What do you see that's so different now in Natick when you come to visit versus growing up here back in your well, youth? Well, I, I, there's so many more people now and uh, so much more traffic. I mean, uh, gosh, when I was a boy, they were still using horses. So <laughs> instead of, you know, there was, just wasn't that many vehicles around and everything like that. In West Natick, growing up, there were some farmland. Oh, yes, it was all wide open space, farmland and uh, nurseries, tree farms and things like that. We, we roamed all over the place. What was your family background? Did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I had uh, two brothers, two younger brothers, and uh, three sisters. Two of them were older and one was younger. And what did your dad do? He was a painter. And was your mother a working mother or housewife? No, with, with the six kids, why, uh, she was kept pretty busy around the house. <laughs> what made you decide to enter the military? Well, World War II, of course, was on. And everybody else was going into the service, either voluntarily or being drafted or something. And uh, when my turn came, why, I, was, I just went along because I was happy to go. Were you drafted or volunteer? I was drafted, yes. What year was that? Do you remember? Yes, it was May 1944. And what branch of the service? I went to the Army. Did you choose the Army or because you were drafted you, did you have no choice? I probably could have had a choice, but I, I, I was happy in the Army. I was happy that I ended up in the Army and uh, as an 18-year-old fellow why naturally I didn't have any skills so the infantry just seemed to be the perfect place for fellows like me. Did any of your friends join up with you? Uh, yes there was four of us from Natick that went together and three of us ended up taking basic training together. Where was basic training? Camp Croft, South Carolina. What was it like? Oh, it was great. I mean, it was a lot of physical activity every day, and uh, we trained on all the different kinds of weapons we were going to use, and we were all young and exuberant, and uh, no matter what difficulties came along or what happened, why, we just had a lot of fun. I know that sounds foolish to say that, but we did. We enjoyed ourselves and had a lot of fun. Did you develop close friendships at that point in time with any uh, of the basic training groups? I don't think you could say it was close friendships, but everybody of like minds, more or less, on their own, got together. You hang, hung out with you know fellows of like mind, so to speak. Uh, I was never a drinker or anything like that, so uh, we did more things on the athletic side, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. Kept busy when you didn't have to do some of the training yes, work yes, with but, athletic uh, things? That was very, very, uh, not very often though because we were busy, kept training all the time. Did you train for specific things? You said you were infantry. Infantry, mm -hmm. yes. So I have to assume then you trained with guns? Yes, mm -hmm. oh, rifles, machine guns, mm -hmm. mortars, bazookas, hand grenades, heavy machine guns everything that had to do with the infantry. And from that, learning all those different pieces of equipment, was there one specialty that you kind of showed? Uh, well, uh, I didn't choose it, but I ended up as a rifleman and what they call a rifle grenadier. 
and explain something about that. Well, the uh, rifleman part, of course, was just handling rifles, and shooting rifles. And uh, the rifle grenadier is, I had an attachment that fit over the barrel of my rifle that would let me shoot off rockets. And uh, each squad had one man who was designated as a rifle grenadier. And so that was my part of my job. Was it because you showed specific prowess in no, doing? No, no. It, it just happened, happened to, be to be the way it came about, that's all. After basic training, what was your first duty station? I was sent to uh, Camp Butner, North Carolina, as a part, became part of the uh, 89th Infantry Division. And how long were you there for? Oh gosh, I think I joined them in late October of 1944. And then we went overseas, got ready to go overseas in December 1944. And I was with them till the end of the war. And when you got word that you were going overseas, were they clear on where you were going? No, we never had any inkling of where we were going. Mm -hmm. No inkling whatsoever. And in keeping in contact with your family back then, did you have time to tell them that you would be going overseas? I think I did. I know uh, a couple of days before Christmas, the company commander gave everybody 48-hour passes who wanted them. So another fellow and I decided we'd try and make it home here for one last visit before we went overseas. And uh, we, we got here and everything like that, but of course we only had a few hours to... To say to stay, farewell. But, yeah. Now, when you traveled up, did you travel by train? Yes. Yes, the trains were mobbed at that time, too. And I know we waited about three hours down in Durham, North Carolina, trying to get on a train. And finally, as the train was pulling out of a station, going real slow, this colored fellow inside the colored section of the train raised up the window and motioned us to come like this. So we jumped in or dove in through the window. And he pulled us into the train. And that's how we got to uh, Washington, D.C. So you got to D.C. in the, back then was called the colored section yes, in of the, the colored train. Yes, the colored section, right. And they welcomed you openly? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, they were very, very friendly, and uh, I don't, I, they would probably still be there if they hadn't pulled us into that window. Sure, sure. <clears throat> now, coming back home for, as you said, just specifically a couple of hours, yeah. Yeah. Did, was your family and friends prepared for you to come home? Did they know you? Were I don't think they even knew. No, no. Mm -hmm. no. It was it was kind of a surprise, and as I said, it was just kind of a impromptu decision we made to try and get here because we only had, like I said, forty eight hours. And uh, I, I know uh, the next morning I was leaving the house, and there was a very light snow falling, and uh, I'm walking up West Central Street and uh, to Framingham and I, I look back towards the house and uh, all you could see was my footprints in the snow. Very touching. I know Ooh. to this day my sister. <laughs> How old was she at that time? Oh, I think she was one year old and I was 19. So she remembers it vividly too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you went back then down to, is it Camp Buckner? Yes, Camp Buckner. And you were going overseas from there. Yes. So tell us what happened. You were put on a ship? Yes, well what it was, is, uh, it was kind of funny because we loaded on a train and we came up to Taunton, Massachusetts to Camp Miles Standish. So we ended up sailing out of Boston. And uh, the ship I was on was the Edmund B. Alexander and it was a, large ship. I, I forget how many people were on there, but they could only feed us two meals a day because by the time everybody got through eating, it was time to start again. And it was an unevent, uneventful trip. I mean, it was, seemed to me that was, as far as you could see, there were ships on the ocean. And no matter which direction you look in, there were ships. And uh, uh, as a, um, I know before we left, the Red Cross was there at the dock and gave us uh, coffee and donuts and a little bag with toilet articles and things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And was the trip over uncomfortable for you? Well, we were packed in like sardines, but 
uh, as I said, we were so young that everything was an adventure. It was a, it was a great adventure, that's what it was. And whatever the difficulties were, they just didn't seem a big deal, that's all. And how long were you at sea? Ten days. Ten days. Ten days. And then where did you land? We landed in La Havre, France. And can you spell La Havre? Uh, L E, mm -hmm. and then uh, capital H A. I think it's V R E. Mm -hmm. Once there. Well, I, I was struck by the devastation of everything. I mean, it, it, gee, it, all there was was bombed out houses, bombed out port, uh, so sunken So this was ships. in the winter of 1944? 1945. Now yes. it was... We reached there in January, January. 1945. Okay, January. It was bitter, bitter cold, cold, sleeting rain, and uh, we, we went on landing by just to shore, and then we loaded on these open trucks and everybody was just frozen. We were frozen. And we were trucked to a temporary place called Camp Lucky Strike, a tent camp. It had been a German airfield at one time, and it was just knee deep in mud. Even though it was cold, the ground wasn't frozen. It was just knee deep in mud. And uh, um, it, I think our first job was probing for mines. There were still German mines all around the place, so we had to you know, crawl on our hands and knees with a bayonet, probing for mines. That's where they had the first casualties. And you were 18 or 19 years old at this time? Yes, I was 19 then. I had just turned, in fact, I turned 19 on my, on the trip over. So you're doing this dangerous probing work. Yes. And you're seeing for the first time casualties yes. at the age of 19. Yes. What was this like for you? Uh, well, the, the first casualties, as I said, they were there, but I wasn't at that vicinity when they happened. You'd hear about, well, so-and-so was killed or so-and-so was wounded and things like that. So, I mean, everybody was all, it, it, it's hard to describe about people being killed or wounded or something because you don't want to see it. It is hard to see it, but at the same time, inside, you're glad it isn't you. And that might sound harsh or something like that, but that's just how it is. You don't want anybody to be hurt, but at the same time, always glad that wasn't me. So, were you afraid at that point? Uh, not really. I don't think I was afraid. I think because uh, everything was so new, and when you're that age, you're indestructible. You're really indestructible. You you. You don't, you always think that it's going to happen to somebody else, not you personally. Mm -hmm. And so you just kind of go along with the program, so to speak. Now you said you took a small shovel type of instrument for well, digging? For mines? Mm -hmm. No, well, there was the bayonets that fit on the our bayonets. rifles. It was like a long knife. And you just go along and you stick it in the ground at a very shallow angle. When it hits something solid, well then you very carefully brush away whatever dirt or mud is there and mark that mine. And then they have fellows who come along after you who are trained to dispose of these, get them out of there. We just had to find them. Find them and mark them. You find them and mark them, yes. So on a typical, say, afternoon, if you had this job to do, how long were you out? And were you in fields? Were you in towns? We were in a field. As in I said, it, was a, it had uh, been a German airfield, mm -hmm. so there was a part of it that was a hard surface landing strip for airplanes, but the rest of it was like a big field or something. So how long would you be out there searching at oh, one you time? You might be there for four hours or so. And then once you got back to your tent area, were you exhausted? Was it emotional? Uh, well, you were kind of wound up. You were wound up, and it was kind of, it was nice to, whew, glad that's over with, and I uh, hope it's somebody else's turn tomorrow or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, they always had something for you to do, so you, you didn't have much time to, you know, worry about too many things because you were always kept busy doing something, mm -hmm. always. And how long were you in that area of La Havre? I think we were there approximately four weeks, Something like that. And then from there, what happened? Then they loaded us onto uh, cattle cars and we went to. I'm sorry, let's just fix this one second and try not to touch it. A 
Okay. okay. Sorry. And then we went to uh, Luxembourg, the city of Trier in Luxembourg. And that's when we first went into combat in Luxembourg. And tell us about that. Well, we were supposed to uh, make a river crossing and the engineers were trying to build a pontoon bridge across the Moselle River. The Moselle River was running through the city and we were supposed to make a river crossing over a pontoon bridge, but the Germans were shelling it so heavily that the engineers couldn't build the bridge. So we just stayed out of sight in houses and cellars and things. And then the next morning, or maybe three or four o'clock in the morning, we paddled across the river in these little eight-man rubber assault boats. Now, when you stayed in these houses, were they empty? Yes, they were. Did yes. you see any of the civilians in the, in the surrounding No, it areas? seemed to me that somehow or other the civilians would disappear. I don't know where they disappeared to, but they just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I, I assume they came back after the fighting had ceased or things had quieted down or something, but it was always a mystery because they just disappeared. So you would see them at some point, yes, but then as, as you all maybe infiltrated a certain area, yes. they would go yes. elsewhere. Yes, like, like say we were going to attack a certain town, like say we were going to attack the town of Natick, for instance, we would see all these white sheets and white cloths hanging out of every window and every place indicating that the people themselves had surrendered. And as I said, we wouldn't see them but maybe people who followed us up would see them after we had gone through because uh, I was infantry, so we were always in the front all the time. And uh, supply units or uh, hospital people might see them, but we never saw them. Mm -hmm. So you got into Luxembourg. Yes. And you said you started in with direct combat. Yes. Again, because the bridges couldn't be built, you had to then cross the bridges? No, we paddled. You paddled. We I'm had sorry, these little rubber that. assault boats, mm -hmm. six or eight men assault boats, and we got in those, put them in the water, and then each man grabbed a paddle. And How many approximately were in this infantry division doing this? Oh, God. Well, an infantry division has approximately 13 to 15,000 men. And. Uh, like I was in what they call a rifle company and there was approximately 200 men in a rifle company. Mm -hmm. So say in this operation there might have been uh, 200 men or there might have been two rifle companies. So about 200 of you are crossing this. Yes. And then what happened? Well on the other side it was all grapevines. It was a big steep hill going up and it was all grapevines. Evidently that was a um, wine country or something or other. And we went up through these grapevines and uh, we got up to the top and by this time it's daylight and uh, as just a, a private in the ranks you don't know what the overall strategy is, you don't know what the overall plan is or anything, you're just told to go along here and do this. And We were crossing this field and then the, we come under machine gun fire and everybody hits the ground while well, we're waiting for our leaders to decide what to do next. And a funny thing happened during this time. I'm, I'm laying on the ground and off to the right a little bit is this big pile of horse manure, big pile of horse manure. And so uh, while I'm laying there, I heard my uh, uh, sergeant talking with the company commander by these little handheld radios telling him that we were under machine gun fire and we were held up. So I heard the company commander saying over the radio, I'll send Lieutenant Morgan up. He, he had, was head of the mortar section, and he'll take a look and see if he can see a target, then call back to the mortar section. So, uh, so let me just question you here. How far away would, the sergeant would be with you. Yes. How far away would the commander be? Oh, gosh. He might be 100 yards back. I mean, it might be a little further. I don't know, tell okay. you the truth, mm -hmm. where he had his headquarters. And so pretty soon Lieutenant Morgan came up and he's crouched down behind this big pile of horse manure. And I heard the company come in and say, well, what do you see up there, Morgan? And Lieutenant Morgan says, right now, Captain, just a big pile of horse manure. And <laughs> everybody was so tense that we just all cracked up laughing. It was <laughs> probably very helpful. <laughs> Relieve the tension. We just could not stop laughing. <laughs>
Oh, <laughs> there was a kind of a, a, a barn in the distance with a half, half the roof blown off it, and my squad leader says to me, he says, Chase, see if you can drop a couple of these rifle grenades or rockets that I'm telling you into that thing. And so I did, and uh, just, just pure luck. No other way, I couldn't do it again in a hundred years. One of these rifle grenades or rockets went right through the hole in the roof and dropped inside and exploded, and the machine gun fire stopped. So pretty, we got up, we're moving forward again, and uh, pretty soon someone who was in another squad who was closer to this old barn says, hey Chase, there's a couple of dead krauts in there. So whether it was my rocket that got them, I don't know, but. Uh, but have you thought about that at all? Well, uh, <clears throat> naturally you think, hey, that's somebody's father or son or brother mm -hmm. or something or other. But uh, as I said, it was done from a distance, so that's easier than face to face. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Could you tell, this was probably, as you said, a vineyard. Could you see any kind of beauty there or was it just total devastation? I can't recall one thing of beauty. Not one single thing of beauty. At that time of year, it seemed to me I had this impression of a day like this all the time, just gray and just lousy. And cold. Cold, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I don't think any of us thought out till about June or July. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a good question, thing of beauty. I can't recall anything of beauty. No, I can't. So you kept moving forward. Yes. And you still didn't know quite where your destination was. No, mm -hmm. no. So All I know is our division was part of General Patton's Third Army, and we were more or less in the center of Europe. Uh, I can't even, I, I can't really recall some of the towns we went through, in Germany even. So you went from, did you ever see General Patton? No, no, no. no. Did you ever hear stories about him at all? Uh, I, I don't even remember that much. Mm -hmm. I really don't. I, now, I know this is going to sound crazy, but it's a God's honest truth. We had to wear neckties. Every we, day? Yes. In General Patton's Third Army, you wore neckties. Along with the rest of your uniform and, I would assume, yes. warm coats? Yes. Yeah. He wanted a formal army. I don't know what it was, a form of discipline or what it was, but we wore neckties. <laughs> so did that differentiate you between your group and other groups that as soon as they saw you coming with neckties, they would yes. know you were part of Patton's yes. army? Yes. Really? <laughs> yep. Very interesting. Yes. So going through Luxembourg, tell us then what happened in the future. Well, Oh, as I said, we would be going forward all the time, and again, I can't tell you any real direction other than we were heading eastward, generally eastward, to eventually meet the Russians. And we went uh, to different towns, and uh, I know in one, one town we were, came up to, and gosh, my squad leader, I don't think he was any further away from me than six or eight feet, and all of a sudden I just saw him drop his rifle and fall right down. He'd been shot right through the side of the head here. And how old a gentleman was he at that time? How old? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I think he was probably 30 years old, mm -hmm. if he was that old. He was from New York, I remember that. But he recovered. That was he good. He recover. Yes, he recovered. But seeing that happen, and who, who takes over and in, in what circumstances? You just call for a medic. There's always medical people with mm -hmm. you. And you call for a medic, and a medic comes up and uh, takes care, dresses the wound, and gets a couple of litter bearers, and they carry him off to an aid station, load him in an ambulance, and take him back to you know, where the aid station is and everything like that. Did you have that sense again? Thank God it wasn't me. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, always I had mm -hmm. that sense. No, we, we continued on into Germany till we came to the Rhine River, and we, uh, I know, I didn't know it at the time, but later on in reading accounts, the 5th Infantry Division had crossed the Rhine River, either upriver or downriver from us, the night before. And the Germans didn't know they were coming, and so they surprised them and they got across without any trouble. Then when our turn came, the Germans were fully alerted that we were coming. 
And this was at St. Gore and St. Gorehausen. I remember those places. Were this Lorelei of the Rocks or something? Whether you ever heard of that or not? Mm -hmm. Anyway. And once again, it was a, a river crossing in the little rubber boats. And uh, uh, that, that was tough because the, the Germans were on the other side on the high ground. They knew we were coming. They were waiting there. And we're paddling in these boats. And the, the river is very swift. The weather is cold, and um, are you under gunfire at that point? Yes, yes, they were shooting down on us from these bluffs, and uh, I know I think it was two companies got almost wiped out, two companies, and uh, if if your boat was hit or blown apart or you were blown into the water, you were going to drown because you had so much equipment on and there was just no way of escaping it. That's all there was to it. Mm -hmm. But gosh, the, the boat I was in, we paddled like crazy men to get to the other side. And we did get to the other side. No one was hurt. And to show you how crazy war is sometimes, we landed on the far shore. And all we could think of was finding shelter from someplace. And we found there was a house still, part of it still standing. So we went into the cellar of this house. And believe it or not, here's shelf after shelf of fresh preserved cherries and peaches and raspberries and everything and oh god we're just gorging ourselves on all this fresh canned fruit sure. and afterwards I'm thinking to myself how can you can go how can you explain to somebody you're going from one moment of sheer terror to something like this gorging yourself on food and uh, taking a bite of this oh that's no good and throwing it aside <laughs> Totally unexpected. Totally unexpected. Uh, the experiences from the extreme spectrum, it, it's just hard to explain. And mm -hmm. you can tell things that people just can't believe, probably, but it's true. It's true. And we just kept on attacking all the time till we finally we got up into Czechoslovakia. And we were told to wait, to stop there, not go any further, because the Russians were coming to meet. And I never did get to meet any of the Russians, but they, they did meet some other unit. I think it was the 69th Division. So you, you were originally going to meet the Russians. Yes. And your unit didn't. Maybe elements of my division might have met the mm -hmm. Russians. I don't know for sure, but the, the part of it I was with, we did not meet any Russians, no. Mm -hmm. And getting into Germany, um, and then getting into Czechoslovakia. Did you see any of the um, residents, the, the non-combatants, during any of that the, time of the, either? Uh, yes, we did. Yes, uh, as I said, they would disappear, but then they would come out because, like, say we took a town and then my company might be recalled to go to the rear for some reason or other, while another company took our place because they rotated the unit so mm -hmm. that uh, this unit would be the lead unit one day, another unit would be the lead day. So you're rotating all the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you would see some after a while, but not too many people. But there was no real communication or contact with no, them? No, not really, no, no, mm -hmm. no. So then how long did you stay in Czechoslovakia? Uh, I don't know exactly because we were up there, I think, when the war ended, and uh, I can't tell you. I really can't tell you. So you were there for a number of seasons then, seeing some seasonal changes into the uh, yes, spring? Yes, let's see. We landed there in January, and this was, I think, May. At this time, it was May. Mm -hmm. And I know we weren't there too long because our division was, uh, again, uh, shipped back to France. And then how long were you in France? At that point, did you get a sense the war was? Yeah, the war was over it then. It was over then. It was over then, yes. You remember the day you heard that the I war don't. was over? I don't. That's surprising. I don't remember a thing about it. Uh -huh. I remember the de uh, hearing about President Roosevelt's death. But for some reason, all those things are very vague in my memory. Mm -hmm. I, I know we went back to France, just outside of Le Havre, where we first came in. 
<clears throat> and our division was, uh, uh, different parts of the division were sent to different camps to operate these camps for other troops who were going home. And I spent the, oh, my, must have been the next two months back there in France. And then I was sent to the 83rd Infantry Division in Linz, Austria on occupation duty. So that was an entirely different set yes. of circumstances. Yes. During, prior to, before we get on to that part of your experience, what, what were some of your greatest challenges during combat? Um, well, I think to force yourself to keep moving while someone's shooting at you or someone's dropping artillery shells or mortar shells on you because your instinct is to find a hole or find some place to hide behind or get out of sight, so to speak, but you can't do that. And so it, it just takes an awful lot of willpower. Of course, you don't want to be the one that doesn't move and uh, you don't want anybody to think you're a coward or anything mm -hmm. like that, but it, it does take quite a bit of willpower to keep going uh, under those circumstances. So now the war is over. You're, you're, is your assumption to feel a little more relaxed? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And you're in Austria? Uh, yes. Okay. And tell us about that. I was just there, I think, maybe a month or so, doing nothing but guard duty. Just guard duty. Now That's you're guarding? German prisoners and uh, empty buildings. And did any of the German prisoners have any ability to talk with oh, you? Oh, yes. A, mm -hmm. a lot of German uh, soldiers could speak English. And uh, you, you would just shoot the bull with them like you would with anybody else. And I, I remember one incident that I thought was really nice. Another fellow and I were guarding this large enclosure of German PWs. As I said, the war is over, so there's no uh, animosity anymore or anything like that. And it was hot, really hot. And one of the German prisoners came out with a glass of water for us both with just sugar in it. That was all they had. But uh, I thought that was a very nice gesture. Sure. I really did. I, uh, I thought it was a very nice gesture. And it's just another little thing that stayed in my mind that, again, it's what's the word in Corrigus or something or other with the normal doings. But So you were there for a month? I, a, a month or two months. And then I said, oh, gosh, I can't stand this inactivity. So I re-enlisted and I enlisted in the regular army while I was still in Europe. And then I went to uh, Nome, Alaska. For how long? I was there for 18 months. I uh, was in an engineer unit. On an, it was an air base at the time, Army Air Base, and I was in an engineer unit as a firefighter, fighting aircraft fires and house fires and things like that. And uh, it was good duty, but oh, it was barren and desolate, barren and desolate. Did you know at the time of your re-enlistment that you would be going to know? Yes, you because what, uh, see, what it was, the greater majority of people wanted to get out of the service, no matter whether they were Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guard, you name it, they wanted to get out. But I liked it. For some reason, I liked the military, and I thought, well, gee, here's a chance to see some other part of the world. And at that time, they were offering inducements. You could pick wherever you wanted to go if you just sign up for three years. Mm -hmm. So I said, hey, this is great. I'll sign up for three years. And I picked Alaska. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I liked it up there. It was barren and desolate. But I, I met an old gold miner up there. And he had, uh, he, oh, he's probably late 80s then, but he had mined precious stones in Africa and India and places like that. And it was like talking with a character out of the Old West. And we would sit and talk for hours. And he would show me how he mined gold and things like that. A very, very interesting fellow. And, uh, but the thing I remember most about him was he had the deadliest pair of blue eyes that you'd ever <laughs> seen. Did you ever read a novel and talk, talk about somebody had deadly eyes or something like that? Yes. Well, that's how his eyes were. They were just deadly eyes. And he never would let anybody get behind him. If, whenever you were talking, he always made sure that he was watching you. Yeah. Yes. Maybe from some past experience. Yes. 
yes, he, he just didn't have any uh, trust in anybody. But now, you said you had enlisted for three years, yes. but you were in Nome for 18 months? 18 months, yes. And then? And then I was sent to, uh, see, what happened up in Alaska, they had lengths of duty for different places. Like Alaska was 18 months, I mean, Nome, Alaska was 18 months, Anchorage, Alaska might be three years or 30 months, ADAC and the Aleutian was only 12 months. But uh, because it was so barren and desolate and so many people were going wacky up there, they shortened the tours of duty and they shortened the, my uh, station to 12 months. And I had already been up there 18 months, so they sent me back. And I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in another firefighting unit. And is that where you completed your enlistment? Yes. So at this time now, you're probably in your early to mid-twenties. Yes. Still single. Yes. And you get out of the service? I got out of the service. Out of Fort Bragg? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then what? Uh, I was, well, I started doing carpenter work and driving stock cars on racetracks. In North Carolina, or did you? No, in Massachusetts. You came back? In, uh, yes. Did you no, come back to your home that you? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Yes. Had things changed very dramatically? Uh, I don't even remember. No. I don't even remember. I remember I kept busy and things like that. And it just seemed like in no time at all that the Korean War started. And so then I signed up for another three years to go to the Korean War. Oh, my. In the Korean War. So you were home, you did a little stock car racing. Yes. You were still single. Yes. And you signed up for the Korean yes. War. Yes. So this was an entirely different experience. Yes, it was. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about that? Well, at, at that time, the, the war was just getting started, and they were desperate for men. And uh, I remember I, I enlisted December 1st, spent a little bit of time in Fort Dix, New Jersey. Now, that would be December 1st of what year, do you think? Uh, 1950. Mm -hmm. And they sent you to Fort Dix? Fort Dix, New Jersey. And then I was there just a short time, and then I was sent to uh, Fort Lawton, Washington, put on a plane, <laughs> flown to Japan, given a rifle, spent just enough time to make sure the rifle was working properly, and then loaded on a, a ferry boat in Japan and went to Korea. Did you know any of the um, group that you were with? No, no one. Were you one of the older people in the Yes, unit? I was. And yes. you were experienced? Yes. So how did that play in all of this, your experience? Uh, your right age? off the bat, it didn't play too much. No, I was just another replacement, private first class as a replacement, and just another body, so to speak. And I know uh, we were loading on a train down in Pusan to go a little bit further north where the fighting was, and they issued us ammunition at that time because it was the war at that time was just like cowboys and Indians. The North Koreans and were everywhere, and uh, there was no such thing as a front, more or less. They were everywhere, just like cowboys and Indians. And they said, hey, you guys might be prepared to fight from this train if they attack the train. But they didn't attack the train, and we got to wherever the heck we were going, but it was Teju or Tego or someplace and uh, unloaded, and I, then I was assigned to the 24th Infantry Division. The 24th Infantry? In 24th Infantry Division, yes. And how long were you with them? Oh, gosh. I joined them, I think it was January 1951, and uh, then I was sent home from, because of wounds in June of 1951. You were wounded in action? Yes. In, uh, I remember this very well. March 13th, I was shot through the leg, upper part of the leg. And then uh, in May, I caught a piece of shrapnel in the hand. And then in June, I was shot in the neck. It, it broke my neck, left me semi-paralyzed. Really? Yes. And So they sent me home to uh, Murphy General Hospital in Waltham because I had a bullet in my neck. It, it broke two of the vertebrae, but didn't sever everything. It stayed in there. I still have the bullet at home. Oh, I still have the bullet at home. You do? Yeah, the doctor saved it for me. <laughs> so you were partially paralyzed? Yes. In your second combat duty? Yes. And you're, prior to being sent home, 
was their hospitalization over there? Well, the first time I was wounded, I was sent to the Swedish Red Cross Hospital in Pusan. Oh, wonderful place. You couldn't ask for anybody to be any nicer to you. Just a great place. And when you mentioned you were partially paralyzed, where? Well, uh, from the neck down, yes. Did you think at that point in time that it might be permanent? Obviously it wasn't. No, no. Again, for some reason I had that belief that I might be hurt, but I was not going to be left over there. Mm -hmm. I really did. I had a, a tremendous belief that somehow or other, no matter what the heck happened, I was going to be okay. Now, what was the prognosis of the doctors that you were seeing? Well, as I understand it and remembering back, the biggest problem was trying to get the bullet out. It went in underneath my jaw here, right through here, and ended up breaking the fourth and fifth cervical vertebrae in my neck, but staying in there. And for some reason, the doctors could not take it out the way it had gone in. And they uh, eventually flew me to Japan and they'd have consultations at one of the hospitals there. Then from Japan to, I think it was Wake Island, more consultations, then to Hawaii, then to, uh, uh, I think it was Travis Air Force Base in Texas, I think it was, or it might have been California. And, and all these consultations on how to get the bullet out of my neck, I don't know why or anything like that. And as I said, I ended up in Murphy General Hospital here in Waltham, and they cut through the side of my neck and took it out through the side of my neck. Now through all of this, what is your family hearing? Well, they just get notices that, you know, Donald Chase has been wounded and uh, expect to be recover and so on and so forth like that. Did I know they keep those notices? What's that? Did they keep them? Have, have you ever seen them? what they received? Uh, my sister might have the telegram. When I went in the service, I, I took my, I pulled my, everybody, my next of kin was my sister. I wanted to spare my parents any kind of unpleasantness or anything like that. I figured my sister could, if something happened to them, might happen to me, my sister could handle it better than they would. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she might have the telegrams that they sent her, I don't know. What did your family think about you re-enlisting? Well, <laughs> they were very disappointed, I guess, very disappointed. Did they think you were playing with fire, so to speak? No, I think that at that time, all children were expected to go to work, contribute to the family welfare and things like that. And I, I was just kind of an independent spirit, so to speak. Sure. <laughs> and, and an adventurer, I guess you might say. Were you particularly religious? Not really, no, no. I, I mean, I, I believe in God and everything like that, but I don't think I was particularly religious. Mm -hmm. Because I, uh, after I took the bullet out of my neck, I was sent to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, and then to Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina, and then I, went, I decided to go back over again. So I went back over again in 1952 Back to Korea? Yes, with the 3rd Infantry Division. <laughs> and, and this time the war had changed. Instead of being a war of cowboys and Indians, now it was like World War I. We had a trench line from the east coast of Korea to the west coast. The Chinese had a trench line paralleling ours from the east. And it was like no man's land in between. And you'd go out at night to try and catch them, or they'd come out at night to try and catch you. And uh, we had a few occasions where, you know, things are kind of scary-like and everything. So do you consider yourself a career enlistee? No, no, no. As I said, I was young and foolish and I'd read too many adventure books, I guess. So on your second tour of Korea, you were there from 1952? No, I was there, I went over, got there in November of 1952 and I came back in, uh, I believe it was October of 1953. How old were you at that point? Uh, let's see, 20, 27. 27 years old. Yes. And you come back to the States? Yes. Well, what happened is I got wounded the day before the war ended again. I, uh, a mortar shell dropped in on us and wiped out a couple of guys and blew me up in the air and 
kind of tore me apart a little bit. And so they sent me home a little bit early to be discharged because of my... And these wounds were? This, this last wound, mm -hmm. I had the side of my head torn open and then both legs were torn open. But nothing that couldn't be no, fixed? No, nothing that couldn't be fixed. I mean, I still carry a piece of metal in my head and I have bullet fragments in my back, but I mean, nothing that couldn't be fixed or prevented me from, you know, doing my work and everything like that. So, do, do I assume, I don't like to assume anything, that you have purple hearts? Yes. More I than four one? of them, yes. Four purple hearts? Yes. Do you have them tucked away or on display? How do you? Well, I, I gave one of them to my sister's boy, uh, and uh, no, I don't, don't don't display them or anything. I just have them in a drawer in the dresser someplace. Have you ever been written up in any articles because of all of your experiences? Uh, well, I had a couple of short stories published. One by uh, in the American Legion magazine, they solicited stories of combat experiences. So I solicited a story of my crossing of the Rhine River, and they published that one. And then an author by the name of Donald Knox published a book on Korea, and I got half a dozen short stories in that one. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, I belonged to a couple of uh, this group called the Outpost Harry Survivors Group, one of the major, last major battles in Korea, and so one of the guys said, well, let's have a little reunion of the survivors of that battle, so I belong to that group. So do you still keep in touch with some of these gentlemen? Oh, yes. My uh, company commander and I from World War II exchanged Christmas cards until he died two years ago. Mm -hmm. I still keep in touch with my platoon leader, Lieutenant Nestor, a squad leader from World War II, we exchange Christmas cards. And uh, yes, we write, communicate back and forth between different fellows. So you come back at the age of about 25, having been wounded numerous times with four Purple Hearts. Yes. What kind of life did you lead after that? That sounded not only <laughs> exciting, but a little crazy. Well, I went back into auto racing. You did? Yes. I went back into, I, so I you're like an a, adventurer? What? You were an adventurer? Well, at that time, yes. Yes. And still single? Yes. Back into auto yes. racing. And how long did you do that? I, uh, I think I stopped racing in 1958. 1958. I, I was married by then. I was married in 1955. And did you know your wife beforehand? No. How did no. you meet her? Uh, my brother, my brother, she was a friend of my brother's wife, and she entered, they introduced me to her. Did your family at that point think that maybe you would settle down? <laughs> I, I don't know what they thought, really. <laughs> so auto racing, couldn't have been very financially stable for you. Oh, no. No, I was working as a carpenter all this time. Okay. My, my uh, mm -hmm. regular job was a carpenter, building houses. Built houses. In Massachusetts? Yes, yes. Were you working with any particular company or freelancing? No, I was working for two fellows who, we, had, we were working for uh, somebody in Natick here building houses, and then they just, these two fellows decided to go into business for themselves. Mm -hmm. And we were working together, the three of us, but then I went off to the Korean War, and when I come back, they had uh, set up a real formal corporation and everything like that, so I just went to work for them. Mm -hmm. And how long did you work with them? Oh, I think it was approximately 17 years, mm -hmm. and then they dissolved the business, and then I joined the Carpenters Union and uh, I finished working on uh, commercial buildings, hospitals and steel plants and breweries and things like that. And are you retired now? Yes, I am. Retired seven years ago. Mm -hmm. How important do you think serving in the military was for you? And how do you think it affected the rest of your life? I've always looked back upon my time in the military as my college education. I really do. I mean, uh, I was not a, a scholarly type person, so I mean, I knew college would never be my 
vocation or anything like that, but meeting the fellows from different parts of the country, hearing different viewpoints of everything, it was my college education. It really was. I mean, I was a very naive uh, individual, naive and simplistic and uh, innocent in a lot of ways. And, uh, do, do I get the sense that you might have felt a little indestructible? Well, I, I had that overwhelming feeling that nothing was going to happen to me. I mean, you know auto racing, you crash and bang and flip and everything else, and that happens too, but again... Um, what were some of your worst experiences in those types of situations? In the auto racing? Oh, probably when I hit the wall up to Westboro and <laughs> smashed my face open. <laughs> and you were married at that point in time, or...? No, no. <laughs> No. Uh, in, in fact, I was home on a 10-day leave. I was still single, but I was home on a 10-day leave. And uh, I was due to be back at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Friday night at midnight. But they had auto racing up to Westboro Friday night, so I said, well, I'm going to go up there and race, and I'll worry about getting back to Fort Bragg later. Well, that was the night I hit the wall and smashed my face open, so I went over to, again, to Murphy Hospital. and. Again, Fib told the doctor I fell down a flight of cement stairs, so he sewed me up and gave me a written paper saying that this man has been in an accident and so on and so forth, so I got back there without any repercussions. <laughs> so your wife married you knowing that you had this adventurous side to yes, you? Yes, yes. Did she tame you down at all? Uh, well, I think... I started to realize that hey, you've got a, you've got some re real responsibilities here, and you've got to calm down, I guess. So live to speak. up to those yes. responsibilities. And I, I know that was the main reason I gave up auto racing because I'm starting to think, well, what happens to the family if you get hurt real bad or something like that? So that made me decide, well, it's time to give that up. One of the questions we've asked a number of other um, interviewer, I interviewees, and certainly for you it would be unique because you were involved in two of the three wars that I'm talking about, but we've asked about your sense of the public opinion, the differences of opinion between, um, from the public regarding the servicemen who came back during World War II, during the Korean conflict, and during the Vietnam War? Well, the best thing I can say is that everybody who came back after World War II uh, was received with open arms, open arms. I mean, I mean there was parades and celebrations and uh, a tremendous amount of fanfare, so to speak, and everybody was just welcomed with open arms. Uh, when I came back from the Korean War, Nobody even knew I came back, but th that never bothered me. That never bothered me because I never looked upon any of this as uh, getting public recognition. I mean, I enjoyed the recognition myself of being a part of these historical events and momentous things and everything like that, but I never gave it a thought insofar as public recognition was concerned. Why do you think there was a su such a negative difference with those wars versus Vietnam? Well, I think that somehow or other the mood of the country has changed so that people don't really realize what a great country this is. This is the greatest country in the world and you can talk to any serviceman who's been to any other parts of the world and they will tell you that this is the greatest country in the world and a lot of people who are in positions of power or influence for some reason don't realize that. They really don't realize that. Mm -hmm. And uh, gosh, I, I think that's the big problem, mm -hmm. the big problem. I um, also ask, and I think you have a poem that you read yes. that one thought or memory that you would like to share with family. Perhaps you would like to read this at yes. this point in time? Uh, like, I don't talk too much about my experiences or, or things that I've thought or undergone or things like that because a lot of people don't care. A lot of people would never understand. But I do quite a bit of writing and I put a lot of my thoughts and feelings and experiences 
into poetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have several of those poems, and probably that's the best way to, for me to end this. That would be wonderful. Okay. And I call this one War's Legacy. From boyhood to adulthood, many changes take place, but the scars left by war are never erased. When you answer the call and become part of the fight, then you learn of war's horror with all of its fright. How the shells crash down with a chilling sound while you crouch in fear in your hole in the ground. How the bullets zing or whistle past while a friend slumps down and breathes his last. The enemy soldier, just another man, doing his duty as best that he can. No glory exists in the gruesome sight scene. Haunt you forever and become part of your dreams. When at last it's all over and you sail for home, you carry the scars that are yours alone. Scars on the outside, easy to find. Scars on the inside, etched deep in your mind. The years pass by and memories fade, but thoughts still turn to the friends you made, to those who survived it and to those cut down, who today rest quietly in their spot in the ground. Thank you so much. Okay. I mean, everything I've said is from the point of an infantry soldier, mm -hmm. the guy that wears the blue piping on his cap. Well, we appreciate you coming in today, and you have certainly had quite a number of stories to tell us. Thank you. <clears throat> no, I appreciate being able to <clears throat> get it out. <laughs>